good morning to you. You know, I think freedom is a uniquely human ideal. And it's pretty safe to say that under normal circumstances, every person would rather live in freedom as opposed to, you know, being controlled by others, right? We see this in the political world uh, all around us. Our own nation was birthed because our forefathers wanted to be free from the control of the British monarchy. They wanted to, to create their own union, right, to chart the course of their own nation to govern themselves. We see it in the, the world around us even today as global awareness increases, right? In those places where there is not freedom and the younger generations are seeing people li live in freedom and they're saying, hey, we want that too, like, we want to be free. Uh, and so they're rising up and calling for freedom in their own countries. But this is, freedom is not just a political ideal, right? It, it's evident in almost every part of our lives. Quick question, show of hands. How many here have ever started a business? You've owned, a, you've started a business, right? Quite a few there. According to Yahoo Small Business, an average of 543,000 businesses were started each month this year. It's like six and a half million new businesses started. The number one reason that Americans give for starting a business, be my own boss. I want to be in charge. I, I want to be in the driver's seat. I, I, I want to make the decisions. I want to reap all the rewards, hopefully, and, and not the failures, right? But this desire to be the boss. This is our desire for freedom. What about, uh, think about high school graduation day. What is every graduate think or say out loud. I'm free, right? I got it. You society and education system been making me go to school for 18 years, but now I'm free. I get to chart my own course. I can make my own decisions. I can do whatever I want to do until they get a boss and they realize it doesn't work that way, right? But there's at least a fleeting moment uh, sense of freedom. This is our desire for freedom. And in so many ways, this drive and desire for freedom in our lives is a very positive thing. It helps create great things like our country, right? And, and, and so many businesses and, and, and all that. But spiritually speaking, this desire and this drive for freedom is actually a liability for us. Dr. Paul Tripp makes an uh, insightful and relevant point in one of his parenting books. So he's talking about little kids, but I think it applies to, to pretty much all of us. He says that every child buys into two lies in their lives. They don't know it, but they're buying into these lies. The first lie is the lie of self-autonomy. Every child believes that they can and should be the boss of themselves, right? We know that. You know this about your kids. There's also the lie of self-sufficiency, that I have everything I need right here within me. I should be the boss, and I've got everything I need to be the boss of me, right? Now, we see this. It's pretty easy to see it when they're kids, but I want to suggest that all of us carry that tendency well into adulthood, spiritually speaking, all right? And, and, and when we buy into these lies that I should be the boss of me and I've got everything I need. Now, I don't know which comes first. I don't know if our desire for freedom makes us, you know, uh, gives us that propensity to buy into these lies of self-autonomy and self-sufficiency, or if we buy into the lies and that feeds into our drive for freedom. I don't know which comes first, but I'm convinced that they are connected. That as we buy into these lies that I should be the boss of me, and I've got everything I need right here, spiritually speaking, that that drive for freedom that feeds off of that or causes it becomes a roadblock in our spiritual lives. And it presents challenges for us to surrender our lives to God and to follow him faithfully. The Israelites knew a thing or two about this desire for freedom. Their whole history as a people group uh, is filled with periods of freedom and occupation back and forth. They actually grew from just a family, a single family, into a nation and a people group in the confines of slavery. They, in about the 13th century BC, had moved from Canaan, uh, which, you know, Israel area on our map today, and they went down to ancient Egypt to survive a time of famine. And while they were in Egypt, they were made slaves to the Egyptians. And for hundreds of years, as they grew from one family into a whole people group, 
they lived in slavery until God sent Moses to lead them out of slavery and into freedom. Over the course of the next centuries, they would establish their presence in the land that God had promised to them, and they would flip back and forth between periods of governing themselves and periods of being occupied by other nations. By the time we come to the first century BC, it's the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is on the scene just about everywhere in the known world then, and they are running the show, they are controlling, they are occupying Israel. This is the historical, the cultural backdrop, the current reality of the time that Jesus was born into. He was born to a people that were longing for freedom. In fact, they were watching and waiting for a new Moses-type leader to rise up among them and hopefully lead them into freedom again. Hundreds of years prior to Jesus' birth, Moses, or God, really through Moses, had spoken about this in Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 18. God says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth, and I will tell him everything, oh, he will tell them everything I commanded him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. God had promised the Israelites that a Moses-type prophet leader would rise up among them, that he would be there and that God would provide this. And the Israelites held on to that promise and to that hope. And as they experienced occupation by other countries, other nations, they held on to this hope and they were looking for the new Moses, right? That's why we see scenes uh, like in John chapter 1 where the Israelite leaders come to John the Baptist. He was a charismatic figure on the scene. He was gathering a crowd and a following. And so the leadership come to him. They say, John, we got questions. First of all, are you the Messiah? He says, no. Okay. Are you Elijah? Elijah was prophesied to return. Are you Elijah? No. And then they say, are you the prophet? And they're asking, are you the one that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy? Are you the one that's going to come? Are you the new Moses? He says, no, I'm not. I'm none of that. The next day, John sees Jesus walking along and he proclaims to all that are there, he's the one. There is the one. He is the Messiah. He is the prophet, all rolled into one. There is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Jesus testifies about himself in the same way. After spending about 40 days in the wilderness, he's doing spiritual battle with Satan, being tempted and coming out victorious. He returns home to his hometown. He goes to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he reads from a scroll there. Luke writes about it and records it for us in chapter 4 of his gospel, starting in verse 16. He says, He, that's Jesus, stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now we have to understand that as he was reading this passage from Isaiah, People were resonating with it. It was deeply stirring their hearts. They ached and longed for the freedom that Isaiah was talking about, to be set free for the oppressed. They would have been thinking, we are that oppressed people. We are waiting for the one to come and set us free. And then Jesus says what is hoped for, but unexpected. He says, everybody, the one Isaiah was talking about, that's me. I'm here. Now you would think at this point everyone would be clapping and jumping on board. Jesus is the new Moses train and, and they would be excited about that. But the fact is most failed to recognize who Jesus was and the role that he would play. You see, 
The new Moses was in their midst, but he did not function the way they expected him to function. He didn't do what he was expected to do. They were looking at this, this whole original Moses, new Moses scenario, and they said, okay, the original Moses, he led us, you know, the Israelites, out of literal slavery from Egypt into, into freedom, into the promised land, right? That was original Moses. New Moses must do the same thing. And, and we happen to be occupied by Rome right now, so new Moses is obviously going to lead us out of this occupation by Rome. He's going to get rid of of the Roman Empire and give us our land back. The problem was, new Moses was there. It was Jesus, but he was not going to lead the people out of their Roman occupation. And they could not understand, they could not grasp that God had sent this prophet, this new prophet leader, this Messiah, for a much larger purpose. He was not going to lead Israel out of their occupation. He was going to lead all of mankind into freedom out of slavery. But it would not be a political or a national freedom at all. It would be a spiritual freedom. Because just as Daryl showed us last week, Jesus' coming, his birth, Christmas as we call it, marks the turning point in history. And it was the turning point from sin, being dominated by sin, to having a savior. And Jesus sets us free. Because we were all dead in our sin, we must have a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior satisfying the penalty that our sin requires. But just like He is our Savior, He is also our liberator. Just as Moses was a liberator. We were locked in slavery to sin. Not just dead in our sins. We were slaves to sin. And we needed a liberator. And Jesus is that because he is our savior, because he has paid the penalty, because he will forgive us when we trust in him, he is also our liberator and he sets us free from our slavery to sin. But what does he set us free to become? It is not a freedom of self-autonomy and self-sufficiency that we've talked about. Jesus doesn't set us free to do whatever it is we want to do because we're good enough on our own. Jesus' freedom and the freedom that he gives us is really a freedom to choose who our master will be. Jesus gives us the freedom to choose who our master will be. So understand this, and this is maybe a harsh reality check for us. In a spiritual sense, none of us will ever be free in the sense of self-autonomy, self-sufficiency. We will always spiritually have a master in our lives. We will be subject to somebody's control spiritually. Jesus gives us the option of who that is. When we trust in Jesus, we get to choose who our master will be. It will either be the master of sin and death without Jesus, or it can be the master of God, his righteousness, and his life that we receive. We get to choose that. In writing to the people of Rome, the Apostle Paul writes this in chapter 6 of Romans, starting in verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. Free from sin so that we can be slaves to righteousness. Now that feels a little weird, right? To think, oh, I get to be a slave to God. Yay. But that, we kind of balk at that. That doesn't, that doesn't fit well in our hearts and our minds because slavery, as we think about it, is terrible. And, and, and it is. So why would I ever even want to be a slave to anyone? In the ancient world, slavery was a little bit different. Not only was it so pervasive that it was just accepted, like, oh, you're a slave? Yeah, I was a slave last year too. Things changed, but now I'm not. And everyone, you know, it just was commonplace for people to be in slavery doesn't make it right. It just was. But there was even uh, an official way for a person to stay a slave because sometimes being a slave was better than being set free. 
and the, and the condition of your life in freedom. And so that, in the Roman Empire, there was a process. If you've been a, become a freed slave, uh, either by time or you bought your freedom, you could stay a slave. You could voluntarily become and stay a slave to that master. We are forcibly made slaves to sin. From the very beginning of our lives, we are forcibly made slaves to sin by virtue of our human nature. It's not our choosing. It's not uh, you know, an option that we checked on the, bu- you know, on the page. It's just reality. We are made slaves to sin by virtue of our human nature. And sin is a terrible master. It brings nothing but hurts and brokenness to our lives. Look at Romans 6 again in verse 20. When you were slaves to sin... You were free from the control of righteousness, but what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Sin only ever brings death. But that was the other side of Christmas. Before there was a solution to sin, we were all slaves to sin. On this side of Christmas, we are no longer hopelessly locked in slavery to the sin that we're born into. Jesus has come. Our liberator has come. And so now we can choose to stay a slave to sin, or we can choose to make ourselves a subject of God's rule, his righteousness, and receive the life that he gives. Now, some might say, how do I know who my master is? I really have never thought about this. How do I know who my master is? Well, if you have never consciously put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've never reached that point where you acknowledge the the sin in your life and you acknowledge that Jesus is the one who forgives us and you've asked for that forgiveness, you've surrendered your life to him, if you've never done that, the answer is simple. You are still a slave to sin. You may be a pretty decent person. You may be well-liked by everybody, but you are still a slave to sin because you can only be set free when we choose to put our trust in Jesus, when we put our faith in him and we put ourselves under God's righteous rule. And when we do, when we make that choice, our slavery to sin is broken and we become subject to God's goodness and God's righteousness. But everyone who has made that decision will tell you it sounds really simple and it functionally is simple, but living that out way harder than it sounds, right? We're we're not so good at that. It's hard for us to live in that freedom that even though we have, that our slavery to sin has been broken and and we're now under God's rule because of our human frailty and our foolishness, we sometimes, maybe often, go back and put ourselves under the functional control of sin. Even though that slavery has been broken. And so what do we do? If you're realizing this morning, I'm like, I have never thought about this, but now I, I'm getting it. How do I know if sin is my master? Even though I'm a follower of Jesus, even though I put my trust in him, might sin still be my master in some way or another? I got three signs for us that we are living in slavery to sin. First one is this, that if you continue with that sin, despite the negative consequences... If you continue with that action or that attitude, uh, that behavior, despite the negative consequences, when you, can, when you keep doing something, even though it hurts you, you know it has you locked up. You are uh, the slave of that master, whatever it may be, right? It's easy to see it in some of the behavioral things like uh, smoking, right? We all know smoking causes great harm to our bodies and cancer and all of that. And yet people will be like, yes, you're right. It does. <sighs> right? Because it has control over them. Maybe it's some other substance, excessive drinking or drugs. We continue despite the harm because it has control over us. It is our master. Another sign for us is when you work, it's hard to hide it. You've got something in your life and you're working hard to hide it, right? Your greatest fear is that someone will discover that thing, that secret, whatever it is. And so you're covering your tracks. You've got your alibis and your explanations ready to go. And they're pretty believable, you hope, right? And and you're trying to cover things up. 
Maybe it's of a sexual nature, a relationship you ought not to be having. Maybe it's pornography, but you're, you're, you're covering those tracks. You've got your story straight. Maybe it's gambling, right? You're up late night, your spouse is sleeping, and you're there on the online poker or going to the casinos, whatever it may be, but it has control over you. And yes, it's hurting you, but you're still there, and you're working hard to hide it because it has control. Third sign is this, that you feel incomplete without it in your life. You feel incomplete. You just don't feel quite right with the thought of having that removed from your life. You see, whatever we give ourselves over to, whatever we make ourselves subject to, will begin to define us. It will be some, it'll become unimaginable to live without it. Maybe it could be a, a sin of pride. I cannot imagine not having the success and recognition that I've cost, that has cost me so much. But I can't imagine not having that. Maybe it's a person. I can't imagine having him or her in my life, and so I will sacrifice this and this, even my relationship with God, even my obedience to God. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a feeling. I get such a rush when I can, you know, go out and whatever, buy this or do that. And we become the slave to that feeling. Whatever it is, we feel incomplete without it. So what do we do with this? How do we go from here and live in the freedom that Jesus makes available to us on this side of Christmas? Well, Paul already told us the secret in verse 17 of Romans 6. He says, You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Folks, this is, this is a heart matter. This is not about behavior modification or trying harder. This is a heart matter. And for those who have yet to put your trust in Jesus, your heart is fully under the control of sin. All right? Now, you may be a, a decent person. Everybody likes you. You know, you're, you get invited to all the birthday parties, whatever it is. But your heart is still fully under the control of sin. It is your master. And to be free, the only way to be free from that is to trust in Jesus and to surrender your life to him, to become a subject of God's righteousness. And if you're in that place, we hope that this Christmas season, that that transition will happen in your life, maybe even today. And we'll have some folks uh, available following the service to your right over here uh, from our prayer team. They would love to talk with you about that, answer questions you may have, and help you express your desire to trust in Jesus to God. And we hope that you will take advantage of that today. For those of us who have trusted in Jesus, we're free from that control of sin. Sin is no longer our master, but maybe you've realized as, you, you know, as we're checking the signs and you're like, one, two, three, oh my goodness, they're all in my life, right? I have functionally made myself a slave to sin again. What do I do about that? A few things, a few thoughts of, of how do we address this? What do we do when we find ourselves under the control and, and slavery to sin again? Because as we follow Jesus, we're given new hearts. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We are given new hearts. That heart of under control by sin becomes a new heart in Jesus, all right? And we're completely made new. But that new heart is a progressive experience, right? We don't fully understand it. We're not fully able to live it out. And that progressive nature of our new heart in Jesus means that there are gaps in our experience. There are gaps in our ability to love God fully. There are gaps in our ability to obey him in every way that we want to obey him. And when we have these gaps, when sin enters in again, they can fill that gap where it should be love for God but it's love for something else. So what do we do about that? First of all, if we, if we realize this is happening in our lives, we have to identify what we are loving more than God. And understand this, when we have a sin problem, be it gambling, pornography, whatever it may be, it is because we are loving something more than we love God. It is not first and foremost a behavior problem. It is a heart issue. And love for God is being directed to something else. And those gaps get filled in with love for something else. 
And it blocks our ability to grow and to love God fully. So we have to identify what is it? What am I loving more than God? Is it myself? Is it this person over here? Is it this feeling that I get uh, when this or that happens? What is it that I'm loving more, that I'm pursuing more and elevating higher than God in my life? We have to identify that. And then we got to do something tangible to remove it, to eliminate it from our lives. It doesn't do a whole lot of good just to identify something. That's the problem. All done, right? We have to do something to eliminate it because whatever that problem is, is not going to vacate our lives voluntarily. It's not going to say, oh, you got me. Okay, you caught me. I'm out of here, right? You, you can go back to loving God, right? No, it wants to stay there, whatever that is. And so we have to do something tangible, real, to eliminate it or diminish it to the point where it, we're not loving it more than we're loving God. Something has to fill those gap, that gap in our heart, and we have to remove it. And there's so many examples of what that could be. If you're chasing that feeling that you get when you spend, like, oh, I get such a rush when I go out and buy this or that. I don't have the money, but it's such a rush, I can't stop myself. Cut the card in half. Get rid of it. Shred it. Do something tangible to get rid of it. If you want to break the cycle, man, I, I want to stop drinking so much. Do something tangible. Sit down with somebody and say, listen, I need to tell you something that I don't really want anyone to know, but someone has to know, and I need help. Sit down with someone. Do something tangible to take that step to eliminate whatever it is that you've identified. And then you got to do something new. Do something new that will grow your love for God in place of the thing that you're eliminating from your life, right? If you just eliminate then that gap is going to stay there in your heart and something else is going to fill it. You have to do something new to grow your love for God so that those, space, those spaces and those gaps in our hearts shrink. They're filled in with love for God so that there's less opportunity for us to love something more than him. Increasing our love for God. This is not about behavior modification. This is about increasing our love for God so that our behavior then changes as a result. Maybe it's spending time. You're going to carve out time. And you know what? I'm going to take a, a walk. I'm going, to, I'm going to walk around the block at least once. I'm going to pray and, and just spend some time with God. Or I'm going to go to bed early or get up early or whatever it may be so that I can create space in my life to connect with God, to read his word, to pray to him. Right? These aren't magic bullets here, but they're creating space in our lives for us to connect with God. And as we do that, as we commune with him, we're knowing him more. He's talking to us more. And our love for him is growing as our relationship develops. And those spaces get smaller. And it leaves less room in our hearts for things other than God. Maybe it's finding a way in your life to plug in and be a part of Celebrate Recovery when that starts in February. We talked a lot about that in our last preaching series. Uh, and Celebrate Recovery is a community of people. It's a ministry of people coming together to grow their love for God as they deal with the hurts and the habits and the hangups of their lives, the things that are, are causing problems, the things that have taken up residence in those gaps in their heart. And how do we grow our love for God to fill in that space? That starts in February, uh, but even today, you could sign up on our website just to be informed. Just keep me in the loop on what's going on as we get closer to February 4th and Celebrate Recovery starting, right? You could join. There's already dozens of people that have signed up uh, just to stay informed, and we invite you to do that as well. Again, these are not formulas. These are not behavior modification. These are ways that we can continually grow our love for God. And as that new heart of love expands, it leaves little room for these other sins, this old master to take up residence again. And we hope and we pray that every one of us will experience this freedom that Jesus makes available this Christmas season, either for the first time as you surrender your life to him or in some new and fresh way. It's part of the human condition for us to slip back into the old patterns. 
and to put ourselves back under the slavery of sin. And God calls us to live in freedom under his rule. And may we all experience that. Now, I cannot talk about slavery and freedom this morning without taking just a minute to mention this year's year-end mission offering. That's one of the things I love about our church's Christmas experience is is we do a year-end mission offering where we want to give because God has given so much to us, spiritually, physically. uh, We want to give to others. And this year's missions offering is called Hope for Banchata. And the Banchata people is a community of people that live in India, and they are part of the lowest social caste in their system. You're born into your caste, and and you stay there. There is no upward mobility. There is no path and hope of a better life. You are stuck wherever you are born, and there's no provision for any help. Well, because of their place in the lowest social system, the Banchata people group have very few resources available for them, and there is no hope. There is no one helping them uh, you know, with a hope and better f- options for the future. Because of this reality and their setting, they've developed a centuries-old tradition that is heartbreaking to us. This is normal life for them. But they developed this system where their daughters are employed in family-run sex trade to provide and support the family. And it's to the point where uh, if you were of the Banchata people and you have a daughter, your neighbors come over and they, they they clap and celebrate, not because your daughter was born healthy, not because uh, she's so cute, but because of the income she will generate in the future before she's even a teenager. That is their mindset. That is their understanding and the depths of darkness outside of Jesus. This is slavery. This this is reprehensible. This, This cannot be allowed to persist unopposed and unaddressed. And so we don't. We don't allow it to continue. Right? We've been partnering with an agency, a, a ministry partner, that has been fighting slavery like this in Mumbai for a long time. And we've come alongside them and, and we support them. We've sent people over to be a part of what they're doing and to, and to assist them. And so we have a partner on the ground that we work with in the city of Mumbai. The Banchata people live several hours north of Mumbai. But when our partners learned about them, they said, we've got to do something. And so they set about the process, and they've opened a new center, like they have in Mumbai. They've opened a new one among the Banchata people in their community. There's about 70 different villages that comprise the Banchata people. And they are there on the ground, creating opportunity for these children to have a different future. Whereas they would be come slaves, prostitutes for the family, they can have a different future. They can have medical care. They can be educated. uh, Their room and board is covered. They can be given the hope of a new life here in this world. Now, they're in an interesting dynamic where in this facility, they have more capacity than they do funds. Remember, these Banchata people, they're at the lowest system. They, They don't have money for anything, much less to send their children to this school for a better future. And so there are empty beds and empty desks, and there is a waiting list of children that would like to come here, that would like to have this. As they've been working with families and and kind of building the relationships and, and the reputation in the community, families are becoming willing to send their daughters and sons to this school rather than to put them into the trade, the family trade. But there's a waiting list. And it's not because there's not enough space There's not enough funding for this. And so as we heard about this, we thought, this is something we have to do. This is something we can tackle. This is something that we have to be a part of. And this Christmas season, as we come to the end of the year, we want to help children experience the hope and the freedom that Jesus makes available on this side of Christmas. Not only spiritually, that is, but also physically where they can have a life other than prostitution. And we want to give a scholarship for up to 10 children 
so that they can attend this school for a full year. It costs $2,500 a year for a child, and that covers all food, medical care, clothes, room and board, education, everything, $2,500. And we want a scholarship 10 for this year. And that gives us a big goal of $25,000 in the Hope for, for Banchata program. That's a big goal. We get that. We understand that. But we feel compelled as a church that now that we know about this situation, we need to do something about it. That we cannot let it continue unopposed. And so this morning, in light of the grace that God has given us, in light of the resources and the blessings that he has given us, I don't want to ask you if you will give to Hope for Banchata. I want to be a little bit more bold. Forgive me if I offend you. I want to ask you how much. How much will you give? Because something has to be done about this. And we as a church can do something about this. Jesus, on this side of Christmas, makes freedom possible. May we experience it in our lives, and may we give and extend that freedom to some of these kids. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.